Hello, hello, and welcome. Let's get this kicked off. Hello, I am Lauren MJ, and this is my cybersecurity awareness news and information stream. You can reach me uh, using the handle Lauren MJ on Twitch and also YouTube. I am also on Mastodon at Lauren MJ at mastodon.sdf.org. I am also on Twitter, if you still use that old platform, LMJ underscore OU. That you, that's where you'll find me on Twitter. With that, let's get started. Uh, I don't have any of the, um, the listener feedback. I checked all my videos and there's no comments or anything. So I do appreciate the new followers I have. Looks like I've gotten a few. One is MOPP789. Another one is Salt Smoker. Who followed my channel and also M A W E M E eight six three seven May we me Maui me Maui me maybe that's it I'll give it a shot why not so with that um, we don't have any listener feedback let's move into the next part although I am gonna not do my how-to instructional this week Again, I'm skipping that, but I'm putting something in its place this week. What I'm going to do instead of it is I'm going to cover a couple of, uh, not necessarily articles, but a couple of uh, stories that you can pick up and read yourself. And uh, it's good reading. It, it's like a, like a little bit of a, a further reading kind of uh, a website. Um, so it's going to be, uh, there's two of them. Uh, one of them is an investigation. And so it was kind of like a, just a play-by-play -play of that investigation. And the other one is, um, let me look at my notes here. The other one is a list of books that uh, I found. And these books are basically like a really good collection of hacking books. So I thought, well, that'd kind of be neat to, to uh, feature that. Uh, I also have a website tool of the week, which I think you'll find interesting. So we'll see. Uh, with that, let us get started with the next portion, and that is the cybersecurity news. There is a lot to cover because I haven't streamed for two weeks. So there is a bunch. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to start an article with Forbes. Let me expand this so it's a little bit easier to read. So in particular, this one, uh, let me get my notes back up. What happened to my notes? My notes keep disappearing. Okay, there they are. So um, back over here, buddy. Come here. Okay. So this one is um, TikTok spied on Forbes journalists. So of course, it's exclusive to Forbes, right? It's an exclusive Forbes story because it happened to Forbes. So uh, in any case, what happened here is uh, TikTok had fired employees and they used their own data to track the to track their activities pardon me <coughs> pardon me had to cough there for a second sorry about that so um it would be natural for a person to do investig or uh, a company to investigate employees who might be involved in code of conduct violations however using data that you gathered while spying and then using it for that purpose, that would be completely different. So, um, eh, you know, ByteDance and TikTok have been in the news lately. Uh, they're guilty of using their own leverage and their own technology to spy on anyone who it feels is a threat. Thus, you see the banning of the product on government employee devices. Uh, I'm affected by this too. I am, it turns out, a government employee, so uh, for my real job. So I had to, uh, it's, it's banned. I had to, I went ahead and deleted it. I like to say that it's, uh, it's the first time I've actually enjoyed complying with a law. <laughs> so I don't have any love for TikTok. So deleting it was meh, you know. I didn't really feel that it was a big deal. Um, there are people that did bring up, at least in my organization, uh, they brought up things like uh, journalists brought up issues because um, you know they use it for uh, ad revenue they may use it for recruiting um, but 
for the security vulnerabilities, the security problems with it, the spying, and the outright lying in the media, uh, it was just banned for security purposes. And due to those security issues, you just need to find some other place. This is not the only ad network that you can use. This is not the only recruiting mechanism you can use. So this one is just off the table in those cases, just due to the security issues. So that's what has happened in my organization. Um, and apparently it's uh, really um, around the world, uh, around at least the United States. So that's all I have to say about this. Let's go to the next story, which I actually have three different stories that I kind of just smashed into one here. Uh, it's three different articles. The first article is uh, LastPass users, your info and password vault data are now in hackers' hands. This is by Dan Goodwin at Ars Technica. Uh, he does a great one to rundown of basically what happened. Um, this is this will give you this nice, um, really it's sort of a uh, what you need to know. If you're a LastPass user, this is what you need to know. And unfortunately, I am also affected by this. So uh, I had to get off of uh, LastPass. I decided that, you know, you don't have to. You don't have to abandon a product just because uh, something happened to the product. It happens a lot. Um, people have their data compromised. Anyone, literally anyone, can be subject to a hacking problem or be a victim of hacking or fraud. Um, that doesn't make them a bad person, right? However, LastPass has had a less than glorious response to what happened, and this marks the third time that they've been hacked. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just follow that as a three strikes you're out kind of principle, and I'm going to move on. Uh, what I did move on to is a product called uh, Bitwarden. Oddly enough, Bitwarden imports the export from LastPass perfectly. It even copied over all of my other items that are not things like passwords and web and website information. Uh, it copied over other things like my notes and other types of little items that I put in, into my password manager. It copied them over perfectly. So this is the first article we looked at. The second one is this one. LastPass was slammed over hacked password security claims. This is from uh, Danny Chadwick at Review Geek. So here it is more of a summary of the scandal that's going on. So this this uh, web this website was helpful for that, or this uh, particular article was helpful to understand that a little better. Uh, he also quotes a couple of other sources. He also um, talks about the other features of LastPass. That you know there are good features, there are good things, uh, but here's what you have to weigh out. Uh, they uh, suggest 1Password, which I have no experience with. I don't think I've ever tried them. So uh, that is another option for you if you're looking for some other place to go. Uh, a third article regarding this same type of um, problem. This one is by, and I can't even, I'll give it a try, Gabrielle Svatit. I don't know. Svatit. Svatit. I don't know. From cybernews.com. LastPass review 2023. Is it safe and reliable? Now, in my own personal view, uh, I am giving it a timeout. Yeah, you and your organization may decide to do something different. Uh, it is up to you. Personally, if I were running things, I would give people maybe a choice of three different password keepers that they could use in my enterprise. But one of them, I would make a free version. So I would say, here's a free open source one, and here's two commercial. And I'll give you the choice of those things, and I'll buy it for you, and whatever. That's what I would do if I were uh, running a company. That's what I would provide for people. That way, people have choices, and they also have something. One of them is always uh, you know, in a good light, and you could even move between them if you needed to. So here is uh, this article about it. And it, it basically just does a deep dive of LastPass itself right now. 
what was it really using? What is the actual military grade encryption that it was using? You know, as far as your policies go, if you have a privacy policy, if you have a policy at your job, well, this will be something to look at to make sure that LastPass still matches what you need. So the the basic story is, unless you, uh, you know, that that I have learned from this story, is that the cyber criminals are now in possession of a huge amount of data from LastPass. The data is encrypted, but that data is has confirmed to be all of LastPass's customers and their data. So if they wanted to, for example, focus in on a single person, they could put enough computing resources to break into the vault of that one person. So in this data, if I were the person and trying to use this data and monetize it and weaponize it, what I would do is I would look to see who is a customer that is a high-level customer. For example, government employees or um, maybe State Department employees or somebody who would obviously pay ransoms. Uh, and what I would do is I would offer to delete it. Uh, I would delete it from my stuff. I, in other words, I'm going to sell this data. But I'll give you first dibs. I'll let you decide whether I release your data or not. You can pay me. And then I won't release your data. See, that's how I would weaponize it. <coughs> now, how another person would, would weaponize it, I don't know. But we'll see how things go as the time progresses and what actually happens to the data. Um, again, this is also not new to LastPass. And unfortunately, um, you know, it's easy pickings to, to complain, right? Because LastPass is a, it's, it's in the cybersecurity realm, right? So it's easy pickings to just point and laugh at it. Uh, but it is also prudent to be upfront about what happened, be upfront about what the real, what really is going on, and to do it in a way that uh, your customers would appreciate. So keeping us in lurch for a week, two weeks, you know, going on, quite a few number of weeks now uh, as to what really happened well that's not that's not a good way to treat your customers so there's some things I still hold against them some things yes it's understandable that it's gonna happen to just somebody in the security realm and it's true so uh, do with that what you may uh, maybe someday we will come back to LastPass and we will be able to overlook the problems and move on from there. We'll see. With that, let's go to the next story. This one is in regard to Twitter. Uh, supposedly 400 million Twitter users' data is on sale for the black market. So here's an article from uh, Brian Quarmby of Cointelegraph. Let's see. Cointelegraph. Cointelegraph.com. So these user, this Twitter user's data is reportedly on sale. Now, what exactly is in the data? It says that it is email addresses, phone numbers, and I would assume other metadata like name, possibly, uh, but it doesn't actually say that. 400 million Twitter users. So. I guess they did do a screenshot and you know that's I, I I don't know we'll have to see um, you know if it's truly verified or not they did put out a thousand and as a sample and it is verified as real so we'll see right anyway um, and they're doing basically what I said earlier is that how I would weaponize data they're doing it they're basically allowing celebrities and those with money to uh, pull themselves out of it and then selling the rest. So here we go. I guess this will be the story of the 2023. We're already starting off with a bang, right? Let's do that. So let's go to the next story. And this one is regarding Ticketmaster, which um, my cousin would certainly be interested in as a Taylor Swift fan. She experienced this firsthand. But what we're going to do is look back into the history of Ticketmaster. 
Ticketmaster is getting a lot of publicity right now about the current backlash with Taylor Swift. But the truth is, we've been here before. Does anybody remember Pearl Jam? Yeah. Uh, so this is 28 years ago when Taylor Swift was just a precocious Montessori preschooler. Yes, Eddie Vedder was the most important musician in America. And he was starting to have problems with Ticketmaster. So it's not... It's, it's related. It's just bigger. So what we, if you're really interested in where Ticketmaster comes from uh, and why, how they got their awesome power that they have, uh, this article is a nice read uh, to understand that. So it's, it's almost like they've become a, uh, their own monopoly in the ticket selling industry. Uh, and, and some say illegal monopoly. So we'll see what the Justice Department has to say about it eventually, but uh, we'll see. Ultimately, I think fans are going to make the choice, and so far fans are choosing to stay with Ticketmaster and keep, continue to keep them employed. So I think the only way to really get rid of them is to do like a major fan base thing, you know, to make sure that um, fans are on board and all together in this. I think that's about the only thing that's going to change things. But we'll see. Ticketmaster is a is a monster. Moving to the next story. This one is uh, from Fox News, surprisingly. It is by their cyber guy. Cyber guy. Uh, his name is Kurt Knutson. Knutson? I'm not sure how to say that. But basically, uh, it's about Macs and the malware that could be found on them. So there is a particular app that is on a lot of Macs. And that app has been known now to be uh, a malware. So what is it? What's going on? Um, there's a product called Mac Keeper. Uh, Mac Keeper is one of those products that you so probably saw a lot on websites as ads. So if you ever went anywhere using Safari and you're a Mac user and you went to websites, uh, it would detect that you're a Mac user, and it would suggest things to you. Uh, it possibly even suggested a product called Mac Keeper to keep your Mac safe and clean. Well, um, they end up being infected. If you are one of those people that actually downloaded it, uh, good intentions aside, it was easily abused, and now uh, you need to delete this product. So look for it. It has instructions. Uh, you need to follow these instructions to be able to delete it. Uh, it's always a good idea to run antivirus. It, um, it is a good idea even to run antivirus on non-Windows products. If nothing else, uh, something what I would do is like on my Linux products and my Mac OS devices, what I would do is I would create a bootable, uh, like a bootable USB that had a cleaner on it. And I would just periodically, I think about monthly, I would just go through and do a deep scan. Just to make sure that this last past month, I haven't run into something that I shouldn't have. I used to do that. Now I just have a endpoint uh, resource that I use. But in any case, um, it is worth taking the advice here of removing it. And of course, they have a suggestion. I'm sure they're not making any money on that. Yeah. That was sarcasm, in case you didn't ca catch that. Going to our next article. This one is an interesting take on the industry here. So um, a lot of people think that insurance, well, insurance is just required to pay, right? So let's say that you have insurance on your home and you have uh, been hit with a hailstorm and that hailstorm just completely trashed your roof. Does the insurance company have to replace your roof, your roof? Well, they will call what's called an adjuster. That adjuster will come out and they will take a look at your roof and they will note if it's a complete loss or if it's salvageable and if so, how much of it is salvageable. And they will come up with a dollar figure that they're going to give you to help you repair your roof. Uh, recently, given the area that I live in, we were told 
that entire roof replacements are no longer an option. In other words, don't expect any insurer to replace your roof ever again. So they will come up with some number and it will not be 100%. That's for sure, for certain. It's the same principle going to cybersecurity insurance. There are things that are just not insurable. So if you're getting hacked or attacked, it has now come to the attention of insurance businesses that we can't pay for everything. We can't really help you. Uh, this comes, this is a switch from before because, you know, insurance companies, insurance companies can insure anything, right? If you name it insurance company and you pay an insurance company enough, they will insure it. So uh, if you're Dolly Parton, well, what is your my primary resource? Well, it's uh, her her unique uh, bodily assets, right? So those unique bodily assets are insured up to a million dollars each, as, as I understand it. Uh, so right there, if you have an insurance company and you pay them enough, you can insure anything. So they took on the cybersecurity world. Insurance companies did. They, they said, oh, this is easy pickings. We're going to go ahead and insure you. And if worst case, if you get attacked or whatever, well, we'll have to pay a little bit to get you back out of it. But, wow, we're going to rake in the dough here. We're going to help people by protecting them for, with cybersecurity insurance. If you're like most people, you may have bought it, and you're now learning that your prices are going up. And they're going up by magnitudes. In other words, you will find at least your premium is costing times four what they were a couple of years ago, if not more. And now we're basically saying you're near the point of being uninsurable. That was the take of this article anyway. It was written by Cam Sevesend from, uh, from secureworld.io. Uh, in, in any case, an interesting take on the insurance business and how it relates to cybersecurity. So we're going to probably be in a world somewhere, sometime, where you may have an organization that is just not insurable from cyber attacks, in which case you will have to insure yourself. And what that means is that you have to go secure your own recovery system. You have to do your own risk assessment and your own uh, the resources have to be put into a bank to be able to recover. It's like a way you would insure yourself if you uh, were in a if you're in a state that didn't require insurance on your car. Well, you have to self-insure. You have to take the value of your car, replacing your car. You have to take that value and you put it in a bank, right? So it's just just sitting there. So that if you ever have, if you ever lose your transportation or you've wrecked your car, you can completely replace your car because you've got the money in the bank. Most people can't do that. That's why they pay insurance companies. So if we're in a world where we have to self-insure, that means putting millions of dollars in the bank somewhere just in case we get hacked. Uh, that'll be an interesting world, right? We'll see. Thanks for the follow. 8-Bit Oni. Appreciate you coming by and doing that. Sorry I missed that. It was about six minutes ago. I didn't have that little feed up. I have to figure out my little feed system here so that I can see things as they come in. Hopefully you're still here. Sorry about that. If not... So, let us move on. I've got story seven here. This is also... Um, Twitter leak. Um, and this this has an interesting attack vector, and you, you're going to see this more. And I personally have seen this more and more. And what what it is is it's an attack on the API key, and the API system of products. Um, API systems have to do with the programmability of products. So if you want a way to uh, do something automated with your product that you bought, then the custom, the uh, vendor will offer you an API 
The API is a programmability way of poking into the device and adding records or pulling out things or making changes. So you need to secure those things. And the way you secure them is, you know, through firewall, through uh, uh, maybe a authentication. You have to add certain things to your authentication, like a two-factor, to be able to uh, make sure what what this person did is they're attacking the keys. So that's another way of authenticating yourself is to create an API key. And then that key is always good until you disable it, of course. But if you've got the key and the device is open to the key, you can talk to it and using your key be able to to do automated tasks so in this case I mean you can read it uh, the leak of these keys came from uh, users of three commas which is executing trades so right there I uh, you know you really have to be top of your game if you're gonna run a financial institution these days you know Especially with the trading the way it is now, you know the micro trades, and uh, especially with uh, you know Bitcoin and such. Let's move to the next one because we just can't leave Twitter alone. Two million users, their data, sixty-three gigabytes of it, is now for sale so yay Twitter right this article comes from uh, coindesk.com oh sorry wrong one there were two here the first one was coindesk this one is cybernews.com both of them are about Twitter but this one is uh, a data loss so there's a data breach uh, 63 gigabytes of data on 200 million Twitter users including their names and email addresses, was exposed. It says it's available to anyone for download. I'm a little surprised by that. Usually they keep it back and they sell it, but I guess it's not for sale. Sometimes they weaponize it, sometimes they don't. The important thing to think about here is what this will lead to, right? It, it's going to be weaponized in one way or another. And e given it's not for sale, uh, the other type of weaponization you can do is that people are going to download this and then they're going to start performing attacks, like, um, like phishing attacks against the users. So now that they have your Twitter, they're gonna, they can now look at your posts uh, they can look at your uh, likes, uh, things of that nature. Uh, they can also uh, start to fish you based on what they've learned about you. Uh, so they can create better, uh, more uh, interesting emails directed at you that you will easily click on. So in other words, you're going to click on a, a, a post or a, a link that a, that a friend sent you, right? or what looks like a friend. So now I can, I can, if I have your data, I can construct emails or tweets or whatever I want and point them at you and make sure that you get them in your inbox. And they're gonna look very legitimate because now I have so much more information about you. So that's probably the, the weaponization you're gonna see from a leak like this. And of course, you know, LastPass customers sucks to be you, uh, you're also going to receive this. Uh, and while we're on this topic, let's go to our next next one. This one that talks about those Equifax breaches. You remember that? Well, what was it? Has it been a year? Does it say? Oh, my goodness. Oh, this was 2017. It's been... Oh, my goodness. That's been so long now. Wow. Oh, I'm getting old. What is it? Five years now? Almost six? So they're starting to get payouts uh, from this Equifax breach. So people are starting to receive their checks. And guess what? Is it thousands of dollars each? Mm, no. Here you go. <laughs> Here's what you're getting. Uh, some Americans are getting $125 
some are just getting 10 free years of credit reporting and of course a million dollars in identity theft insurance provided by themselves isn't that nice um talk about disappointing right usually disappointing so we'll, I guess if you want to be depressed go ahead and read this article uh, some people are getting I, I, I thought this was interesting that some people are getting actual paper checks of five dollars and twenty one cents ouch ouch interesting so um, there's a lot of theories about what this is and what's going on so uh, you're welcome to read the article um, I found it to be upsetting <laughs> I guess for lack of a better term I mean to have such a huge breach like this uh, but there you go I guess that's what we get this is what you get for being a customer you get five dollars or less some people got less uh, someone in here like got a, oh, here it is uh, two dollars and sixty four cents right <laughs> wow okay great um yeah we'll deal with that later so this was from uh, Mark Fowerborn from NBC4i.com which I guess is a local news organization not sure where is it uh, where is this place Ohio Columbus Ohio any case, there you go. Kind of an interesting read if you kind of want to update as to where, how, you know, what, what the update is on that five year old story. Uh, but I found it interesting to at least give them a look. Here's what's going to happen. So uh, you can set your expectations in, in regard to that. So let's go to the next one. This one is Uh, new Linux malware uses 30 plugin exploits to backdoor WordPress sites. This is by Bill Toolis. We've quoted from him a lot over the years, over the last few months since I've been doing this, um, and over at bleepingcomputer.com. So what this is is they've they've uh, been able to weaponize WordPress plugins and being able to inject malicious things into them. So uh, you could, what you can see here is like all the different things that you know perhaps you use some of these little plugins uh, if you do this is sort of a wake-up call to say hey I still have WordPress installed and have I got all of my plugins up to date if not you definitely want to give this a read and take a look and make sure that each one of these is either disabled or updated to its latest version uh, to make sure that you're not uh, susceptible to this weaponization because you know that the script kiddies already have this right they already downloaded this and they've already got it running so go to your website take a real close look at all the plugins you're using and make sure that you're up to date uh, okay let's do a happy story the next story uh, this one is called these works are now in the public Domain by Ellen Wexler, who is Assistant Digital Editor of the Humanities at the SmithsonianMag.com. So what happens? What is the public domain? What is, what's going on here? Well, uh, copyright works are protected, but they are only protected to a certain degree. So things like books, songs, uh, f movies, films, uh, they're protected for a certain amount of time. And after that, or before that, you cannot use them without the copyright holder's permission. But after that time, after it has expired, that work, whether it's a film, song, or whatever, it moves to the public domain. Meaning that anyone, for any purpose, can use it, including reprint it, or refilm it, or take the story and make something else out of it, or change the story. This will be... Uh, this will give you a good clue as to why you've seen so many Sherlock Holmes remakes lately, right? Sherlock Holmes uh, got put into the uh, public domain a few years ago. So uh, 
That's why you're seeing so many remakes, right, of the Sherlock Holmes series. You're seeing so many movies based on it. Uh, that's because the the people that are making these these films or books or whatever, they no longer have to pay a copyright or pay a licensing fees for them. So they can very inexpensively make a Sherlock Holmes story because you no longer need the permission of the uh, author or his estate. So uh, there are problems with this, of course. Uh, and I found this start of this article very interesting because I recently watched this show. It's called Enola. Maybe you've seen that on Netflix. I think it was on it. Yeah, it was on Netflix. If you've seen that, it's a cute, it's a cute little show. And it is based, of course, on Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes character. Now, he is, Sherlock Holmes, the character, is in the story. But he has a, uh, not a primary role. In fact, it is his teenage sister who is the primary uh, protagonist. So what Netflix did was they adapted the story of Netflix, of uh, Sherlock Holmes, so that they can play off of what if Sherlock Holmes had a younger sister and she was bright too. What would she do? Well, of course, you're attracting a new audience of teenagers, right, into the into the realm of mystery and crime solving, which is great, right? Um, so the problem is, is that um, you really need to look carefully at copyright laws because Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's works, some of them are in the public domain. His earliest works, especially the early works of Sherlock Holmes of the Sherlock Holmes stories are in public domain. However, the later works are not. And the later works involve the Sherlock Holmes that was more touchy-feely, right? He had a heart, as opposed to just being the drug-addicted uh, genius, uh, clever, you know, spaced-out guy he is, who has no emotion. That one, you can copy but you can't copy the squishy one yet, the one that has a heart. And it turns out, Netflix, if you watch that show, uh, Sherlock is a bit squishy, right? He's, he's, he's nice. He's a people person. So they um, are now violating copyright laws because of that. So uh, we'll see how that works out. But uh, in any case, I like this um, article because it points out some of the other things that are now in the public domain. And you may be interested, like, what, what was in the public domain? What, what can I now read for free, you know? So this is the reason you'll see lots of old books dumped into the public domain. And you'll see them appear on, uh, on shelves, cheaply printed into paperback form. You know, call, maybe they're in the classics section of your favorite bookstore, and they're basically cheaply reprinted into some kind of form that's like a cheap paperback. Um, that's the reason you'll see that, and it'll be only two dollars or one dollar. It's basically covering the cost of printing, and then a little bit of profit on top of that. Also, you'll see retelling of the stories because um, they no longer have to pay a, pay a licensing fee. So now we can rehash all these things. So if you ever want to get to know what's in people's minds later, uh, you know, in the next coupling, couple of uh, years, you know, what kind of uh, stories will you see? What kind of movies will come out? What kind of uh, sitcoms will be pr introduced? Well, you can just look in the, what's in the public domain, and you can kind of poke around there and, and look and see what kind, of, uh, what kind of music, what kind of stories are there, what kind of books, what kind of films, and you're going to start seeing adaptations of those. So it is kind of neat to be able to just, you know, download three books, you know, read them as much as you want and copy them. You know, it's no problem. Uh, so there you go. I mean, I personally, I was a I was a Hardy Boys fan whenever I was young. So uh, it'd be nice to read the first book in the series. Not all of them. But uh, some of them. So anyway, this will this will show you what's there. It's nice that someone puts this together for you. So I appreciate it. Uh, moving on.
let's go to this next interesting little uh, story here. This one, it says, Melbourne Lord Mayor says, vandalism of QR codes for reporting graffiti, so frustrating. I found that interesting because um, of what <laughs> what happened here. It's, it's really kind of funny, and you know, you should have known better, is what, is what I got to say. So what they did was they put this this QR code up all over the, the city. You scan here to report graffiti and street waste. So you can report on people, right? So you just scan this QR code. Well, what was happening is people would take the QR code and they would print another QR code exactly the same size and put it over it so that when a person would try to scan to report graffiti and street waste, they would go wherever the person who put this up wanted them to go. And uh, funny enough, uh, let's see what they said that um, they said the the codes they found, as I thought was funny, the codes uh, lead to a documentary about hip hop culture on YouTube, <laughs> and it documents graffiti as part of hip hop culture. So here you were trying to report graffiti, and you just you learn uh, you're sent to a part to a, a YouTube video on how graffiti is part of hip hop culture. So um, I thought it was funny, but in any case, I guess it can be frustrating too for those in charge. But um, yeah, those QR codes, whatever. I mean, if you're going to scan a QR code and it's on a it's on a street corner or whatever, take a real close look at it and see if it's been covered by something. You know, just just take a real close look, see if it's got a sticker on top of it or something like that. All right, moving on. Uh, we're gonna. We're going to talk about two articles about the same ransomware game. So let's move on to it. This one um, is called, oh, where'd it go? Okay, here it is. Uh, ransomware gang apologizes, gives sick kids hospital free decryptor. So a ransomware gang named, uh, named Lockbit uh, has attacked this hospital. However, they um, apologized. Uh, they said that they punished the person who did it, and then they gave them a free decryptor key so that you can put everything back the way it was. Uh, which I thought that was interesting. Now, before you start thinking, oh, wow, that's a, that's a nice ransomware gang. That's, that's nice. They must be good people, right? Before you get too far in that, um, in that line of reasoning, let's go to our next article. This one is Rail Giant Web Wabtech discloses data breach after Lockbit ransomware attack. So the same people, Lockbit have now attacked this railway provider and they hit them with ransomware and they refused to pay. So they ended up releasing all the data that they had breached. Uh, oddly enough, according to this, if this is true, I mean, take a look at this. Take a look at uh, what, the, what these people do. They produce state-of-the-art locomotives and rail systems. They employ 25,000 people in 50 countries. They did a revenue figure in 2021 of $7.8 billion, which is 20%, moving 20% of the world's freight. Wow. So uh, they went after some big boys here. I I'm not shocked. Again, we always say, look at what people are attacking these days. What are they attacking? They're attacking infrastructure. So no one's surprised that they're attacking the railways, right? That's part of infrastructure. So let's move on. The next story is cyber attackers torch Python machine learning project. So what this is, is there's a machine learning project that someone was able to insert some, uh, well, I would say code, but they didn't, they didn't insert code. They, they slipped in a malicious binary. So in other words, an executable program. Not, not code, but they, they introduced 
a binary, a program. They put a program inside the package for this Python package. Now, if you had executed it, of course, now you're infected. Uh, so it was definitely an interesting attack, I, I, I would think. So they, it was discovered in mid-December. I guess kudos to Sentinel-1 for doing that. And they were able to uh, get it put into uh, other packages due to dependencies. So, wow. Um, man, they're just attacking everything these days. So definitely something where you want to clean up your uh, code. You know, make sure nothing in your code is executable if it's not supposed to be. In other words, if you're providing binaries, fine. But put your binary somewhere else. Or have your binaries checked, you know, uh, scanned every once in a while just to make sure that they're all good. And you definitely don't want, you don't want to put your binaries out there and then have someone else be able to access your binary directory and put their own binaries in there. You definitely don't want that to happen either. So definitely put this on your list of things to check while you're checking through things. As far as, you know, when your code's being released or whatever. In any case, let's uh, move on. Now here is another story about weaponization. So this one is called Hackers Using Stolen Bank Information to Trick Victims into Downloading Bitrat Malware. This is by the hackernews.com. Uh, someone named Ravi Lakshman, Lakshmanen. So what happened here is a pivoting. Uh, you've got an attack where someone was able to take uh, some phishing emails and then drop in a remote access Trojan called Bitrat. What they did was they hijacked the infrastructure of a particular bank and then they used that information to construct messages to be able to lure more victims into opening attachments. So uh, another interesting take on how you weaponize something, right? If you have any sort of access, you can flip it over and turn it into a weapon. And that's what this was done here. Um, again, definitely uh, you know, be careful what you're doing kind of thing. Uh, we are almost done wrapping up here. Uh, I do want to move on to the next portion before we close out, and that is... Um, I was going to do a how-to instructional. I normally put that next in my series, but what I'm going to do instead of that this week is I've got some... Uh, I don't know what to call it yet, but it's basically some deep dives, some further reading uh, that you might be interested in. So if you're if you're into cybercrime, if you're into that sort of thing, here are some a couple of resources for you. And with that, I'll give these to you. Uh, the first one. This one is Fin Seven unveiled a deep dive into notorious cybercrime gang. So I'm not sure it costs. I don't think it costs. You can download this report, but you'll have to. Uh, you'll have to use an email to sign up for it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that right now. But um, you can uh, get a further read on this this cybercrime gang, and you can learn a little bit more about it and what they did, um, what their achievements were, how they were able to do it, uh, the attack vectors they use. Uh, it's definitely something where you are learning about the enemy. You know, if you're a white hacker, white white hat then you're definitely uh, going to want to read this just as a study in the black hats you know what to uh, what to expect from them what you can what you know what your adversary is up to uh, what their methods and their methodology is so i thought this was interesting go ahead and give it a read if you like and, uh, you can let me know what you thought of it too um, i always like these because i like to learn how they work um, what you know i like to learn things like how much money are they really making is it is it really that um, you know, is it, is it really that attractive to go to the dark side? And, you know, it's something I'd never do, but I do, you know, wonder about people that are learning cybersecurity today, you know, if they're, if they, what, you know, what they would think on it, you know, like what, 
are they attracted to this? Is, is, is it an attractive thing? It's just never been attractive to me. But then again, that could be, that could be my value system. You know, my, in my value system, I would not want to take advantage of somebody, even if I was smart. You know, if I, if I had the tools or could, I would just not do it just because of my value system. But then again, everybody has their own value system, right? So um, I would use this as a, just a deep dive and say, well, what can I learn about the other side? about their methodologies and such. Um, another thing that is uh, for interesting reads, uh, in, the, in the interesting reads category, is a site I found called, um, it's called bookworm.social, and the worm is spelled W-Y-R-M. So bookworm, B-O-O-K-W, yrm.social and there you can look at various people's uh, reading lists so if you do slash hacking you will go to this particular uh, bookworm list actually no that's not right uh, I will have the exact link in um, well I'll put it in the chat And I will also have it, you know, when I move this video to YouTube, y you can have it there. But basically, there it is. Uh, it looks like it is bookworm.social slash list slash 415 slash s slash hacking. And what you'll get is this uh, nice collection of programming books, of uh, methodologies, Unix, um, different types of reading material that uh, hackers, you know, you get their manifestos, you get um, a little bit of history. Um, also, some of the, uh, I guess, the thinking, the the background of, of thinking, like, you know, hacktivists and stuff and such. It's a fairly lengthy list of uh, good resources. It's good well-written books you know it's not just a bunch of junk books thrown in there it's it's books that have been around a while these are classics um, classics as in um, if you're well read in the cybersecurity industry you you already have these on your bookshelf very likely so i thought it was an interesting list uh, it may grow I, I don't i'm not sure i'm not sure this this rec two person he might continue to add to it but i thought i found this one interesting so there could be more on there. You could you could do some searches of your own bookworm searches and see if there's someone else out there that has um, hacking themes to it. But I found this one interesting because it has some good. It's a good collection. Pretty good collection. Um, okay, so the next part is I have a couple of tools. Um, one tool that I ran into recently that I found very useful is a product called Cherry Tree. Now what Cherry Tree is, is if you use Office, then you know about OneNote, right? Personally, I hate OneNote. I find OneNote very difficult to deal with because it's uh, confusing as to where it stores my notebooks and it likes to store notebooks in the cloud and I may not like that. So. If you're looking for something that is uh, alternative or free, then take a look at Cherry Tree. Uh, it is by a guy named, he calls himself Gluspen, which his name is Gluspy Pennoni. I guess that's his full name, but uh, they call him Gluspen. He built this and it has a lot of languages. It's got good support. Uh, it has a lot of binaries. You can come down here and download look at all the different uh, types of platforms that is supported by it, including the, the source code, because it is, it is freely available. Currently, I'm playing with the Mac version. Uh, I may also play with the Unix version at some point. I have not used the Windows version yet. Um, I, don't, I don't have a... I have one Windows device that I play with sometimes, but I haven't used it yet. I haven't used it on there yet. But um, I'm always looking for things that are alternative that don't 
they aren't necessarily spying on me and not necessarily uh, you know save things to a cloud that spies on me so I found this tool kind of interesting um, so hopefully you do too uh, again it's called cherry tree and the way to access it is this link here which I will go ahead and paste into the chat as well and of course when I put this video on YouTube it'll be in the description but I found it to be a uh, very good uh, very interesting it does it does uh, if you if you like one note and if you know what I mean by one note then you know how it works it you can create like a notebook and then under a notebook you can have notes and then inside notes you can have hierarchies of things plus it becomes kind of a ubiquitous uh, dump everything into a notebook kind of thing so you can take different things like a picture plus a text plus a document plus plus a spreadsheet plus a table you know you can just basically throw things in there or a bit of code or whatever um, you know something that can ubiquitously accept anything is what you're looking for when you're looking for a good note program and I think this fits the bill at, the, at this point I and, it, and it's being free and alternative is great I, I like the idea uh, it has some handy you know things built into it as far as hotkeys that you can learn and get used to and anyway I found it interesting I'm gonna I'm gonna start using it I'm gonna try to get a little more experience with it see if I like it I ran into it recently and it's been nice um, what else I had a website of the week so that's also on list to do today which is a website tool of the week I actually covered a tool so um, I'm a little bit on that but let's look at um, let's look at the tool I've got for you um, this tool is let me bring it up here it is called risk that is not how you spell risk riskfactor.com riskfactor.com I'll post that into the chat as well so we talk a lot about risk assessments on this show uh, many times we have talked about risk assessments on the articles we've covered so what this is is it's a way to figure out your risk based on where you live so you could put your address in and it will tell you what your risk factors are uh, now before you jump in on this and start putting in your business you need to understand that uh, if it detects that it is a business that you asked for then it's gonna want something from you and I think what it is is you register so I'm, I'm I haven't done it yet I think it's free you just have to register but you can put in uh, you, you know residential and it will tell you I did that on a different page here let me see if I can find it what did I try well let's just let's just try something what is um, what is the White House 1000 Pennsylvania Pennsylvania well let's let's go with something that's very likely a a residential that looks like a residential address so let's just pick that at random I'm not trying to dox anybody I just was trying to find something so this tiny little house what are your risks you know if you're gonna calculate your risks uh, as far as your business or your house well here's a house what kind of risks does this house face what they've done here is they've overlapped all your risks for you this property has risk from two of three environmental factors so there's a heat risk here there is a fire risk and then there is a flood risk that, that appears for this it gives you a likelihood uh, risk factor what kind of flood how high the flood would be if it happened you know that sort of thing so uh, if you, uh, you know shove these figures if you want if you want hard data to shove into your risk factor figures this is the way to do it this is the place to get it so if you're a cybersecurity analyst you're always calculating risk if you're doing like reports of uh, risk assessments and whatever you're always wanting to know well, what's what's your risk what's your risk of what happens you can always go back in history and say what have we faced 
well, we've had two floods in the last 20 years. We've had one fire. You know, so based on that, well, I'm going to say, well, uh, in the last 30 years, we had two floods. So you can, you can do the math, and you can say there's my risk factor. And I've had one fire in 30 years, so there's my risk factor for that. What this does is it calculates it based on the location and map and the features in the location. For example, when you look at the flood report, it shows here where your flood would like to come from. Like this shows you uh, a little bit more detail, like w where would the water run from? So that might be very interesting to you. You know, if you've got a stream or something around you. And also, it may put in things in here that you didn't think of. For example, would you have thought of heat? Maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't think of it. So given that this, that this property that we just picked out at random here, it has seven days above 98 degrees this year and 22 in 30 years. So right there, there's your risk factors. If you want to stretch them out, depending on how you want to do it. Uh, but that means that this person could suffer from power outages, could suffer from an extreme level of heat if you go outside. Uh, they could suffer from uh, a large bills from your AC provider or your electrical cooperative or whatever, however you get your electric electricity. So um, this is a nice tool for calculating risk, especially if you want some hard data rather than just looking back in your own history and say, what have I suffered? Well, this will give you things that maybe you didn't think of or hasn't happened to you yet, but has only happened to your neighbor. So I thought this was a very good tool, uh, really helpful, especially if you're doing risk assessments. Well, that is my show. That is literally all I had. So I do appreciate you coming by. I appreciate your follows. I appreciate uh, coming and chatting. Well, nobody chatted. Well, somebody did. Okay, that's good. Um, thanks a bunch. I'm going to be doing this. Uh, I do this weekly where I go through the news, talk about cybersecurity. So what I'm going to do is uh, I do have one viewer. Why don't we try a raid? I don't think I've ever successfully raided anybody. Let's try to raid somebody. How about that? Maybe we'll pick somebody that uh, is doing, you know, maybe, maybe in the science and technology field. Oh, that was my chair. That was not good. All right. So this is a guy that I uh, was looking at the other day, and he was doing some some some. Uh, what do you call those? Uh, it wasn't like a red team thing. It was uh, a little similar. He was kind of doing some hacking of a of a hack me now or try to hack me dot com or one of those one of those uh, tools. And uh, I found it very interesting to watch. You know some of the tools he uses. Actually, that's where I got um, cherry cherry tree. So uh, let's give him a um, a raid and see how that goes. I just also want to learn how to raid, so let's give that a try. Let's do that now. So thanks very much, and we'll see you later.